Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics Election 2020 Fall Discussion Group. Today is the third week in our seven part series, Politics, Pandemic and Protests. This fall, we're gathering virtually on Wednesday afternoons to explore the 2020 presidential campaign and the larger political landscape. And after the last several days, we have much to discuss. I'm Colleen McCain Nelson, and I'm a fellow at KU's Dole Institute of Politics. I'm also vice president and editorial page editor at the Kansas City Star. And before coming back home to Kansas, I was a White House correspondent and a political reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Today's conversation will focus on how COVID-19 has upended this campaign season. And it's funny because we actually started working on the details of this discussion series back in the spring, choosing a different topic for each week's event. So it was quite some time ago that we decided that we would talk about the coronavirus on October 7th. But as it turns out, this is exactly the right day to focus on this topic. Way back in the spring, the pandemic brought the 2020 presidential campaign to a virtual heart, halt with relatively little warning, canceling candidates rallies for months, throwing the conventions into limbo, shutting down in-person fundraisers and reshaping campaigns as we have come to know them. Today, we'll talk about the policy, the politics, and the public health questions surrounding the pandemic. And of course, we'll explore the implications of a massive outbreak at the White House after top advisors, Republican officials, US senators, and of course, President Donald Trump and the First Lady were infected with COVID-19. Before I introduce you to our guests, I do want to mention that we plan to make this an interactive conversation. I have questions for our panelists, but I want to give everyone watching a chance to participate as well. Later in the discussion, we will leave some time for our audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please type it in the YouTube chat box on your screen. And if you could hold questions until later in the program, I'll let you know when we're ready to have you start typing. Just a reminder that the Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. So please phrase your questions with this in mind. Questions that are distracting, disrespectful, or attempt to dominate the chat will be deleted and the user will be removed. Finally, before we move on to the program, I wanna thank Newman's Own Foundation, which is sponsoring this series. Okay, let's dive in. I'm excited to introduce you to today's guests who both bring deep political knowledge and unique insights to this conversation. First, Dave Helling was born in Texas and raised in Overland Park, Kansas. After attending Creighton University, where he served as student body president in his senior year, he started as a reporter at KHAS Radio and moved to other stations until 1999, when he arrived in Kansas City at KCTV5 as an anchor and a reporter. In 2005, Dave started working as a political reporter, columnist, and multimedia reporter. Dave is currently an editorial writer and columnist at the Kansas City Star, so I'm lucky to call him my colleague. And he's received numerous awards and was a teaching fellow at the Dole Institute of Politics in 2014. Welcome, Dave. Great to be here, great to be here. Great to see everyone, <laughs> my friends. Dr. Patrick Miller is an associate professor of political science at the University of Kansas since 2013. His areas of specialization in American politics include political psychology, public opinion, electoral behavior, political parties, survey methods, and quantitative research method, methods. He's originally from Virginia, did his undergraduate studies at the College of William and Mary, and received his doctorate from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He would love it if you would follow him on Twitter, where he tweets about Kansas and national politics. You can find him at pmiller1693. Welcome, Professor Miller. Thanks for having me. So we're going to be talking about COVID-19 today and talking a lot about the president um, and his diagnosis and the political implications for that. Um, I wanna start by saying, of course, that we wish the president well. We hope that he and the first lady are recovering as well as their aides and, and the other officials who've been diagnosed with that. Um, today, we're going to talk about political implications and policy around that, but just want to state at the outset that we, of course, wish them well. Um, Let's start though with the broad question that looms large in the race right now and that we've all been contemplating <laughs> since about 1 a.m. Friday. And that is, how does President Trump's coronavirus diagnosis change this campaign? And that's a huge question and there are many different tentacles uh, to, to that. So I'll let you dive in wherever you think it is appropriate. But Professor Miller, how does this change the campaign? Sure, I was about to go to bed and then I saw that on Twitter. <laughs> 
And then I didn't go to bed for quite some time. <laughs> um, you know, I think personally, I was very agnostic about what the effect would be. I think the one thing that I thought that would be pretty certain was that the mass of people, of Democrats and Republicans who tend to just filter politics through that partisan lens would probably create some narrative for themselves that they were comfortable with and that didn't upend their thinking. Um, I think my uncertainty was about that person who's less partisan, more in the middle and what they were gonna think. And honestly, I had no idea. Um, I think if we look at polling from the last week, we see Biden doing a little bit better. Um, it could be one of these temporary changes that doesn't last. Um, and I think one thing we've definitely seen in the polling from Fox, ABC, other sources is that most Americans already were not particularly fond of how the president has been treating COVID, but when asked particularly about his own situation and how he may have gotten infected about two to one, <clears throat> excuse me, thinking he didn't act particularly responsibly. So I, I think it's turned into one of these things that in the short term might be costing him, but of course we still have a month until election day. Dave, well, Cole, how, how do you think this has affected the campaign? Well, I, I, uh, I'm interested in what Professor Miller had to say. I, I think it may have a broader impact, not just on the presidential race, but all the federal, you know, House races, Senate races, and others this year, because it's pretty clear for the last, to me anyway, over the last uh, six months, uh, that Democrats broadly were going to make the response to coronavirus uh, a central issue in the campaign. And the corollary of that, of course, is health care, the Affordable Care Act, and really, you know, uh, an emphasis, if you will, on on uh, health care costs and health care efficacy in the United States. And so anything that gets the public's attention focused on COVID uh, is uh, at least potentially a threat to not just President Trump, but the Republican Party. And you can see that because he's been trying to change the, the, the uh, subject for some time. I mean, he'll bring up uh, immigration or he'll bring up tax policy or spending or the Russian hoax anything to stop talking about COVID. And there were signs, I think, maybe two weeks ago that there were, he was having some success with that. He was, he was still behind a little bit, but you got the idea that maybe COVID was not front and center in every voter's mind. Well, his illness, of course, changes that dynamic dramatically, um, in, in which people are, you know, not only watching for, you know, how the government treats COVID, but how he personally responds to illness. I mean, you know, people wake up, is he sick? Did he, is he feeling better? Does he, did he get an injection? What does that mean? What, you know, what protocols is he uh, undertaking? And so anything that puts the, the spotlight back on COVID, I think is, uh, affects the race. And while I think the numbers that the professor cited of you know, the drops in the president's polling are more reflective of his debate performance than it is COVID. I think the debate may have hurt him a little bit. Yeah. I think talking about COVID more or less nonstop between now and election day will not only be a problem for him, but for, you know, Roger Marshall, Mike Parson, uh, Amanda Adkins, all candidates in our area who, who uh, uh, you know, ha have to in some ways defend the president's response and who have more or less endorsed this idea of sort of a laissez-faire approach. They all say wear masks and, and do, do those kinds of things. But, but, you know, let every district make its own decision on schooling and let city councils and county commissions decide. And as the numbers have crept up and now as the president gets sick, I think that returns to issue number one. And I think that helps Democrats up and down the ticket in my mind. I think that's a great point about turning the page and, and certainly the president had been spending a lot of time trying to change the subject um, in the weeks leading up to his diagnosis. He wanted to talk about the economy and how great it, it has been under him. He wanted to talk about law and order. He landed 
ended on that as a theme for a while. Um, and and now we're obviously all talking about coronavirus again. Um, Professor Miller, do you think it's possible to change the subject at this point or at any point during the next 27 days? Or is this now just a campaign about the coronavirus? Well, a, a month is a long time in politics. And I'm sure that there, you know, I'm sure that there will be an attempt to bring other issues in the race. I don't think that it is an issue, I would agree, that Republicans necessarily want to talk about. You know, there is really kind of a trend here since 2016. You know, if we look at, there have been a number of interesting studies that quantify what candidates are talking about in campaign ads in 2016 and 2018. And Democrats have been talking a lot about health care in the last two elections, three election cycles, counting this one, Republicans, not very much. We see that reflected in polling where healthcare is a top issue for Democrats. It is a lower issue in the top 10 for Republicans who tend to be thinking more about security, immigration, oftentimes independents are in the middle. So I think it is disadvantageous for Republicans from that extent that it, it does get them off the narrative of the issues that in the last four years, they have been focusing on more, particularly when the attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act through legislation failed, you know, now going the judicial route with that. Um, and certainly if we look at how Americans have been responding in polls all year about how they feel about the president has handled COVID, if I were a Republican candidate, it's not an issue I would want to engage with, or I would try to frame it in some very different, vaguer way. I think kind of what we're seeing here in Kansas, like the Affordable Care Act is actually a huge issue in the Kansas Senate race, but no one is calling it that. No one's calling it Obamacare. We're, we're making big claims about it on either side with different language. Um, but I, you know, I think if I were a Republican, I would want to change the agenda. Can, can I just embellish that a little bit, Colleen? Um, I started saying this about a year ago, and I think, Professor Miller, maybe you have polling to back this up, but I think the overwhelming uh, uh, feeling among primarily suburban voters, and of course I live in Johnson County, I have some sense of that, is a, a longing for a return to normalcy. You know, just they want a normal life. If you talk to people uh, about uh, the current sort of situation of the United States. They'll mention COVID, but it's more, my kids aren't in school. I can't go to a movie. I'm worried about being sick and my life just isn't normal. I don't go to work. I work out of my basement or whatever. And, and the president is part of that because he is, however you might think about him, politically, uh, violates that idea of normalcy. I mean, he's tweeting, he's you know, all in caps. He's, you know, he sucks all the oxygen out all the time. To the extent that he could get people to forget about that, I think he would be successful. I think people long for this return of sort of a normal environment. His illness reminds them of how abnormal their lives are and how there is an alternative. And I think Joe Biden has been very smart about this sort of offering a, ret a return to normalcy. And that, by the way, is not just COVID. That is law and order. That's all the disruptions. That's all the tweets. That's all the, just the, the maelstrom, if you will, around the, the White House today. And this illness just feeds into that idea of, of, I don't want to say chaos, but that's the word you hear. And so it's broader just than, you know, his sickness reminds people of COVID. It reminds them of how unsettled our country is. And I think that's really hurting Republicans in the suburbs. Uh, and I think the polling may, may bear that out. Yeah, I mean, on that point, there was a lot there. Uh, <laughs> a different direction is to take that. Um, in the polling, average Democrats and Republicans are pretty polarized about every aspect of COVID. That said, you know, I, I think one, our rhetoric that we are hearing is dominated by the extremes that are not necessarily representative of average Democrats and Republicans. I think when I tune into social media, I get the feeling that Democrats are a bunch of people who think that we should duct tape ourselves in our houses and not see anyone. And Republicans are a bunch of people who think that COVID isn't real and we should all go have a big party, right? That's the, that's the message you get from social media. That's not what polling tells us. Uh, there's a lot more consensus. Um, you know, look at the latest ABC poll. 
over half of Republicans are concerned that they or someone in their family, they're, they're very or, or seriously concerned that someone close to them or they themselves will get COVID. Now, of course, that's 90% among Democrats. A lot of Republicans are still social distancing and wearing masks. Of course, the numbers for Democrats are higher. So there is more consensus here along party lines, despite the stereotypical extremes and despite how the two party leaderships are talking. Um, and in particularly among Republicans in the last week, there has been that uptick in personal concern, I think possibly as a artifact of um, President Trump getting COVID. So, you know, I, I would just say it's not as polarized as we think. I do agree on the point on suburbia, you know, the story of American politics for the last 20 years that I don't think we really began to appreciate until 2016 is the realignment of white voters along education lines. Minority voters are not realigning in that way. The Republican party is becoming a party of the white working class, increasingly whites without college degrees, lower income whites who often are in suburban to rural areas. Whereas the democratic party is becoming the party of up, upper class whites, effectively, college educated, higher income in a coalition with minorities, those population and, and those kind of whites cluster in suburbia. So I think in the first half of the last decade, what you were seeing was Democrats getting their clocks cleaned in rural America. And then that end of that realignment starts to happen more visibly in 2016 with suburbia moving over to the Democrats. Um, so I, I do think there is that mood in suburbia I think it's bigger than Donald Trump. I think Donald Trump is running in a very different environment than he was four years ago. He's not novel anymore. He is known with the record, but it's all also in the context of how our two parties are actually becoming very different animals and coalitions from even what they were in the 1990s. So President Trump obviously has faced a lot of criticism um, for his response to COVID. Um, on the other side, Joe Biden has gotten a lot of credit essentially for wearing a mask and saying that he believes the scientists. And um, I'm not sure that, uh, which to his credit, he has, he's done and said both of those things. I'm not sure most voters could tell you what he would do exactly um, in terms of responding to the coronavirus um, in, in detail. Um, he, he shows up in a mask, he, he says, you know, kind of in broad strokes, the right things. I'm not sure he's really broken through with, with specificity of a plan. Um, Dave, do you think that Joe Biden is getting off easy in terms of, of having to answer the question, okay, you're in the Oval Office, what exactly are you doing in terms of national mandates, in terms of lockdown, in terms of can businesses open, should kids be in school? Is, is he getting off easy by just showing up in a mask? Yes, he is. The answer is clearly yes. He, he is not facing the scrutiny on his COVID response plans, whatever they are, uh, in the same manner that the president is. Uh, you know, the mask is clearly virtue signaling by the, the candidate and, and Kamala Harris as well and other people around him, although there is obviously some safety element involved too now that the president is sick and others around. Uh, him and the campaign have had some problems. Um, but uh, the broader point is also interesting too. I think that the American people were much more willing to give Donald Trump leeway on his COVID response than maybe we understood even three or four months ago. I mean, I, I do think there's a consensus that Gosh, he hasn't done well, but what could he have done better? I don't know. I mean, uh, if, if I were king of the world, would I have done anything differently? I'm not sure of that. You, you see that, I think, in the numbers which suggest the president still gets broad support on the economy, even though the economy just collapsed in the second quarter. I mean, the GDP went down 33% or whatever the number was. And I think that's because, you know, the American people were willing to say this is unique. We've never been through this before. The answers are not clear. I, I, I get that. Um, and, and, and I think I think the public was willing to give him more of a pass than we saw. I think the president hurt himself just enormously by holding daily press conferences where he sort of rambled about COVID and maybe we could inject some bleach or maybe we could put some disinfectant light down the throat or what. I do think people looked at that and thought to themselves, what the hell is that about? You know, we, 
let, let's calm down and think about some rational steps that could be taken to improve the situation. Now we're in a place, and to get back to my earlier point, you know, I'm, a, I'm too old for this, but let's assume I had a second grader. Most of the people I talk to with, you know, second, third grade children, they're most interested in getting their kid back to a regular schedule, back in class, you know, a better education. And they're thinking to themselves, which president would make that more likely? And I think Joe Biden is winning that argument right now. And they're not really focused on, because I think what Professor Miller is talking about in terms of the great polarization of the electorate is based much more on culture than it is on policy. Now, I don't think voters are sitting down and comparing A and B, Joe Biden's COVID response to Donald Trump's, you know, masks, not masks. I do think they're asking themselves, which president would make it more likely for my life to go back to kind of what it was? And I think Joe Biden is just winning that argument. And I think the, that's why the debate was so problematic for the president, because it just reminded the voters of this chaotic uh, churn that I think they just, they just are very, very tired of. So I, on that, I would say, you know, with, and it's gonna be very interesting if, if Biden does win the election, how our attention is going to turn to what he can realistically do. Um, you know, Biden does have a plan up. Um, I believe he just put it on a mug and you can buy the mug um, <laughs> or it's on hand sanitizer, one of those. Um, you know, it largely deals realistically with what a president can do at the federal level with legislation to help states and, and particularly federal response. Um, but our political system is not going to change if he gets elected such that he now has the power to personally control what's happening with masks or schools. A lot of that is still gonna come down to what's happening at the state and local level. Those people will still be important and what's happening with you know, us individually as citizens and our individual choices to wear masks or not. So the entire system that really in many ways is not working together right now still could not work together if Biden becomes president, but he might just pass, get some bills passed that direct money or create certain kinds of resources. Um, you know, to an extent, you know, we can ask is Biden getting off fair, you know, unfairly or easier or not, but to an extent that's also how politics works because presidential elections are about their referenda on the incumbent or the incumbent party. You know, whether that's in 2000 and George W. Bush presenting himself as someone who is more moral, going to treat the office with more respect than Bill Clinton did. We weren't really too interested in investigating George W. Bush's morals or when Barack Obama gets elected, um, you know, we just know Bush did not seem to handle that crisis well, George W. Bush and the economic crisis and somehow Obama is going to lead in a different way. Voters hold parties accountable, presidents accountable, often without asking or really scrutinizing what that person is going to necessarily do when they come into office. And I, and I agree with Dave's point that at least on that, you know, you go back to that rally in February, I believe it was, in South Carolina, where, where President Trump did not call the existence of COVID a hoax, but he called concern about it a hoax and said that it will, it will not be a big problem. And then when it became a problem, it will go away by itself. And then even if he didn't say things like only 10,000 people died, people close to him did. And I think for the average American, it all gets wrapped up in this narrative of Donald Trump not taking it seriously from things he said or his allies said that will probably be what a lot of swing voters vote on on election day. Professor Miller, I'm interested in how the coronavirus and the, the guidance we received from medical experts became part of the partisan divide and just got knitted into, you know, kind of the different camps you were describing earlier in this country. Um, we haven't seen that in other countries, much as like we haven't seen other countries have kind of the same partisan divisions about climate change. Um, I'm interested in whether you think the pandemic had to be political in this country. Was that possible to avoid? And is do you think it's possible to get to a place in this country where some of these issues where we're relying on scientists or medical experts, where we can have trust in government and, and trust in the scientists or is just everything going to be political from here on out? Well, I think nothing is per se 
fated to be partisan or political or polarized, especially when there is not a track record of that issue being polarized. Um, you know, there are lots of issues that we can point to in the last 40 years where Democrats and Republicans were on the same page, but when party leaders started to disagree about that, abortion would be a great example, looking at polling in the 70s and the 80s, the average partisans just followed. Or interestingly, trade, where, you know, and Donald Trump's a great example, where he comes in and in many ways runs as a liberal on trade in 2016, whereas the Republican Party had been more conservative and average Democrats and Republicans just changed what they thought about trade um, in polling. So if it has become partisan on the street level, I absolutely think it's because our party leaders made it that way and we mimic and we follow. It was not destined to be that way. And I think that the big contrast between us and other Western democracies is not that the response didn't become political in those countries. I mean, it did. I mean, the UK would be a great example of that. But how you treat the seriousness of the virus and then what you do at the street level, whether it is wearing a mask or social distancing, or do we have a temporary closure of schools that turns into a long-term closure, that did not become super partisan in other countries. They really were not debating those things. It was more of what do we need to do now to hurt in the short term and then shut it down as much as we can and then we can all go back to normal as much as we can. Um, that didn't happen here. It was very, very partisan from day one. Uh, but this is one of those instances where I would say, look to our elected officials as the people who modeled that for us as average citizens. Yeah, and I think, uh, uh, Dr. Miller, the, 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 uh, from the very beginning, there was a sense among lots of Republicans, and I think the president shared this view, that shutting down the economy, whatever that meant, closing schools, closing businesses, canceling tournaments, all that stuff back in March and April, lots of Republicans saw that as not aimed at COVID, but it, aimed at, it was aimed at ruining the economy so that President Trump would not get reelected. And so immediately there was this partisan tinge that we're, we're not doing this stuff because we're sick, we're doing it because the president has the greatest economy in American history and the Democrats want to ruin it. Through that prism then, through that window, every decision that got made at every level of government suddenly becomes either pro-Trump or anti-Trump. You know, if you're wearing a mask, that says one thing. If you close your schools, that says another. If you require, you know, if you say restaurants can only be 50% full, that's not about COVID, that's about hurting restaurants and therefore hurting the president and bringing him down. And so I think almost from the beginning, this was fated to become a political issue, which again, Donald Trump fed into by, by encouraging that view among his followers you know, let's reopen on Easter, you know, with no real attention to what the public health people were saying, but it was a political gesture. Let's reopen on Easter. And I think that's plagued this debate from the start. I do think a lot of people are surprised that we're still in the middle uh, of dealing with this virus. I think a lot of people thought it would be gone by the end of the summer. And then one other thing we should maybe talk about a little bit too, Colleen, is not just the sickness itself, but the economic reaction to it. Uh, you know, the president's muddled message over the last couple of days on stimulus. And I mean, I think that has an impact on some of this discussion as well. But, but the broader point is, I don't think there was any way to ever avoid it becoming political because it was seen that way almost from the start. I, I think that's a good point. And I, I do want to talk about the economic impact of this and, and I Obviously, stimulus has been front and center over the last 24, 48 hours. Right, right. Um, there are so many COVID-related questions on voters' <laughs> minds beyond, beyond public health concerns. Um, so yesterday, we had kind of a, a back and forth with Trump debating with himself. At one point, he pulled the plug on negotiations for a coronavirus relief package. By a few hours later, he was tweeting about doing kind of piecemeal stuff. And then, um, you know, it's it's kind of hour to hour. And at this point, the two sides are still very far apart in terms of, um, you know, a big package. Um, if Congress does nothing, Dave, between now and election, Dave, um, who will voters blame? And, and does it matter to voters at this point whether a coronavirus 
bill gets passed before election day? Well, I think that the blame question is fascinating because I, I you know, the, the president, again, as you rightly suggest, was at war with himself yesterday, killing the talks and then saying, let's bring back parts of it. Um, I, I turned to my wife last night and said, wait a minute, let me get this straight. The Democrats were willing to write a check to every voter <laughs> for $1,200 with Donald Trump's name on it and send it to them two weeks before they go to the polls. And Trump said, nah, I'm not interested in that. I mean, that, that's... Good point. I, I, you know, it's another head shaker uh, about the president's approach. Um, on the other hand, and again, Dr. Miller, the polls show that of all the places where people still support Donald Trump, it's on the economy or the issue of the economy. And I do think that the Democrats will share some blame for the collapse of some broad-based stimulus um, because that, you know, they control one house in Congress and people will be angry on that basis. And the other thing that surprises me uh, is that I think the president could have taken more credit and maybe should have for the first stimulus, which most economists will tell you actually, you know, there was waste and you, were, you find some problems, but generally speaking, turned out to be pretty effective and unemployment, the unemployment rate of course shot up and now it's dropping again. You know, it's not, the recovery isn't quite what people would like, but it's certainly not the depression that I think we all anticipated back in, you know, April and May. And you would think he would take more credit for that. Uh, he has not, so that's another missed opportunity in my mind. The other thing that the president has to deal with is the Senate seems very, very reluctant to do anything. Uh, and hurting those cats in this environment is extraordinarily difficult. But again, I think it hurts people like Roger Marshall uh, to not have some stimulus package because uh, people will want to look to the Senate as a place where they might they might uh, get some relief if they change horses, and that that may be an issue in that race. You know, when in eras when we have divided government, when voters out there in the middle are looking to reward or punish based on what's going on, they tend to to pin that reward or punishment on the president. Um, there are a lot of Americans today who I promise you don't have any clue which party controls Congress and a lot of those people will vote. Um, so, you know, we do tend, tend to center those evaluations more around the chief executive. You know, I, I think if I were to rewind the Trump administration, I think it's fair to say that in many ways, President Trump is not typical for a politician, especially how he messages and is oftentimes not as disciplined. I mean, his Twitter was pretty lit yesterday. I mean, let's acknowledge that, <laughs> contradicting himself on stimulus. Um, if you were to rewind all of this for years, what he, I think, could have done to set himself be up better now, even with COVID, was to message clearly on the economy and to begin to try to take credit for that without sticking his foot in his mouth, if I can say that, with other things that were more distracting. I think for the last four years, we have been so distracted about some of the more controversial or incendiary things that he says, that the focus is therefore not on what he might want us to focus on. And I think he's a big player in that because he undermines his own message so much. Um, and you see that in polling. Uh, it's really only in the last, right before COVID, when voters really started to tilt more in the direction of giving Trump credit for the economy rather than themselves or businesses or Barack Obama. Um, I think Trump could have had that happen earlier if he had been more disciplined in the messaging about that, but he wasn't. Um, and then of course, after the election, we may get more stimulus, but as we know with politics, we all become concerned about debt when we're spending on things that we don't like. But if we're putting the credit card out for things we like, we do like, then debt doesn't exist. Um, so I'm sure that issue will come back, particularly if Biden wins. So during yesterday's six, seven hour period when Trump was on the side of no, <laughs> no stimulus, pull the plug, he, he told members of the Senate to just focus on getting his Supreme Court nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, um, uh, approved. And, you know, that should be the priority. Uh, Dave, I'm interested in your thoughts about the average Republican voter and whether that person cares more about 
confirming a Supreme Court nominee versus getting coronavirus relief? Well, I think the average Republican voter, Colleen, does care more about the Supreme Court, or at least the average Trump supporter. That's, that's a huge thing for that party and for the president. But the average voter, I think polling shows us again that it's the reverse, that people are much more worried about the economy of COVID or the, the impact of COVID on the economy than they are about confirming uh, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, particularly in the current environment in which there is, I think, some understanding of what happened to Barack Obama's nominee four years ago. And the idea that you would rush this through at the expense of $1,200 checks in the next two weeks, the, the normal political calculus would say that's probably not, not the direction that you would want to go. Um, but, but again, I think the, the president's conflict, you know, people say all the time, just ignore the tweets and look at the policy. The tweets are the policy and, and, and have been the policy. And that's particularly true now. And, and so you can't ignore them. And to see the president yesterday, uh, yesterday saying no more talks, well, maybe there will be talks. Then Mark Meadows said today, no, the negotiations are over. Well, maybe we can do something for the airlines. Maybe we can't. That just adds to this atmosphere of dysfunction and chaos that I think is the president's biggest problem, as opposed to the specifics of, you know, whether there's going to be you know, money for state and local governments. I think we care about that as reporters and certainly politicians at that level. But I don't think the broad public is is you know, going to make a yes or no decision on Donald Trump based on that issue. But the idea that they can't get anything together, they can't get this fixed, it's a dysfunctional governor, uh, government, and Donald Trump tweets incessantly about that dysfunction, I think it's just a problem for him. And, and, and Dr. Miller, I mean, every poll over the last 48 hours has seen another two or three points. I say every poll, virtually every poll that I've looked at shows another erosion of two or three, maybe four points toward the former vice president and away from President Trump. I mean, Rasmussen had, had Biden up 12 points today. That's the world turned upside down. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is, yes, with Rasmussen. Be nice here, they threatened to sue KU student for talking about their polling record. Uh, yeah, uh, but you know, I mean, back, back to the judicial versus COVID question. Um, and, and I agree, Republicans would not like the election to be held today. They have a month. Um, I have actually not seen the question posed, which would you rather have, COVID, whatever, stimulus, relief versus judge? Um, you know, traditionally, since the 1990s, your Americans who care more about the courts do lean substantially more Republican, more conservative, mostly because your real constituency for courts is heavily evangelical. Uh, you know, it's, it's white evangelical Christians who are losing on abortion rights, losing on gay rights, and taking that conservative majority of the court opens the door to, you know, undoing same-sex marriage, undoing abortion rights, right? Long-term goals of that movement. So for the past several decades, that has really been the pattern. What is different about this nomination is not that Democrats are more concerned than Republicans or prioritizing it more, it's that that party gap has closed and they are equally concerned or equally prioritizing it as an issue. So that advantage that Republicans have traditionally had about this has turned into no advantage, which actually is, is different and kind of helps the Democrats that they're revved up about this, maybe because it was Ruth Bader Ginsburg and she's an icon uh, for many liberals. But yeah, I mean, I think that's another one of those issues though that he would like to turn the attention to that, but his own messaging undermines that. Uh, in this case, his own actions uh, undermine that. You know, I think the, President Trump likes to act like the government is separate from him, but he is the chief executive of that government and he has the ability to lead and negotiate in that government. And four years ago, when you're not an incumbent, people see this as different. It, it's, it's refreshing in some ways, but when you've been running that government for four years, and you're running against that government in many ways, I, I just don't think it's as effective. You said earlier, Dr. Miller, that the Republicans have a month. Do they really have a month, do you think? I mean, I think, first of all, people are voting now uh, in, sure. in important states, A, and B, um, 
I, I do sense that if, as we get closer to Election Day over the next month, that the desperation of this president will become more apparent. He's already tweeting in all caps. And, and, and so you get the idea that he may start, you know, any Hillary and the Russian hoax and all that today, that, that if he feels like he is losing or it's slipping away, he may become more aggressive and some would say more desperate rather than the other way around. And that would feed this atmosphere of, of chaos that I was talking about. It doesn't seem like they have a month to turn this yeah. around. Well, you know, th things are closer in swing states and his situation is not as bleak when you look there rather than national polling. And you could certainly envision, I mean, be prepared for another electoral college popular vote split. I mean, I think that is entirely within reason, particularly if he can pull off those narrow wins in in enough of the swing states. Um, I would be surprised if he won the popular vote. Um, but but I think there is more capacity for Republicans to salvage this um, than we might think. Um, it, this election is a little bit different in many ways. Um, you know, 2016, you had and this is part of the issue with polling. It wasn't actually the polling. It was that voters were so fluid right up until election day about, are they going to vote? Who do they vote for? Particularly Republicans. Republicans had a harder time coming to terms with Trump than Democrats did with Clinton, but then cumulatory drops and they, they lock in. So there's just a lot of uncertainty. People are more set this time around in who they're going to vote for, even your swing voters. So, you know, I don't think they have a month, a month to persuade 95% of us. I think they have a month to persuade maybe 5% of us who are uncertain about whether we're going to vote or not. And if we are who we vote for, and certainly if you're talking about a, a state like Florida that's basically tied on average in the polling, that, that could be the difference. Yeah, I, I think that may be right, but the idea that that there is some message that you could come up with in the next two weeks that would swing those five percent that didn't swing them over the last six months boy that's a really you've got to draw to an inside straight i mean i don't me, think that message exists i think if i were advising the republicans it would be change the topic <laughs> Um, I did want to spend a minute on debates. Obviously, uh, we have a debate tonight between Kamala Harris, Mike Pence. We're eight days away from what is supposed to be the second presidential debate. Um, even before Trump tested positive, there were questions about whether Trump and Biden would really debate two more times and whether any of us really wanted to see them debate two more times. Um, yesterday, Joe Biden said there shouldn't be a second debate if Trump still has COVID. It seemed to be kind of like the beginning of laying the groundwork of an escape hatch, possibly for Biden. Um, I'm interested, Professor Miller, in what you think each candidate has to gain or lose about proceeding with debates and and uh, and whether you think there will be more debates. Yeah, you know, I didn't watch the first one live. I watched it the day after and I'm kind of <laughs> glad I didn't watch it live. Um, you know, I think that first debate a look at the polling. There's there's no evidence that went well for Trump. I think it is very difficult to disentangle that from then him getting COVID right after. So his slide right now in the polls, I can't tell you which one it was because they're too close in time. Um, I think strategically, Donald Trump's interests are probably best served by behaving uh, in the next debate, trying to be more presidential and changing the topic as much as he can back towards things that might be more favorable towards him. But again, I think the way he acts and things that he says get in the way of that. Um, Biden, you know, I think Biden's strategy of just standing there to an extent and letting Donald Trump talk worked pretty well for him. Um, if Trump acts differently at the next debate, then I think our focus is gonna be more on how Biden is acting, how he's attacking, what he's choosing to say. Um, and that changes that calculus a little bit. But of course, we'll have to see if that even happens. Right. You remember Dave, there was, what do you uh, think? You, you remember uh, back when I was in college, you didn't have a 24 second or 30 second clock to shoot the basketball. 
and teams had all perfected their, you know, freeze the ball game, you know, where they just pass it around for six or seven minutes to keep the ball from the other person. And I think Joe Biden's team understands that perfectly. I mean, they've done an extraordinary job of freezing the ball. Again, I do think he gets a bit of a pass uh, from the press and public on his relative inaccessibility during this time, but it has turned out to be a pretty good strategy. I do think tonight's debate will be very important. If there's a, a potential inflection point or a change point or a corner or a, a fork in the road, whatever analogy, it might be if Mike Pence can turn in a great performance in which he's calm, focused, rational, smart, uh, and provides a contrast with the president and reminds people that at least at some levels of government there are folks in charge who have a seriousness of purpose. The problem, as Dr. Miller and others have pointed out repeatedly, is if you get that performance tonight, there is a high likelihood that the president will do something tomorrow that will blow it up and just suck the oxygen out again. We don't know what it would be, but maybe he fires Mark Meadows. Maybe you know he's mad about what he said in, in Walter Reed, or maybe Maybe he says, no, let's do a big stimulus now. I mean, you know, I think four years have shown us that President Trump is not happy when others have the, the spotlight. And so, you know, if, he, if his people can get to him and say, look, let Mike Pence help you reset, then I think tonight's debate could be important in that way. I do think there's a better than, you know, there's a not zero chance that there won't be any more presidential debates. I mean, I, I you know, Joe Biden now has a cooked in excuse. Hey, this guy has has a deadly virus. I'm not going to be in the same room with him. Last time I was there, none of his family wore masks and, and, and threatened all of our health. So um, and, and again, that would fit in with the, the sort of small ball approach or freeze the ball approach. Um, but we'll watch tonight. I mean, I think it will be interesting. And Mike Pence is very good in those settings. I thought he was very good four years ago. Uh, you know, he has a good command of the facts. He was in charge of the coronavirus task force, so he can talk with some authority about what was and wasn't done. Um, uh, and um, so, so I think it'll make a difference. It could make a difference. If the president will let it make a difference. If he doesn't, then it's, it's another 12-hour story that wisps away in the wind. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to ask one final question and then I'll cede the microphone to our audience questions. Um, so if anyone watching has questions for our guests, go ahead and please start typing them into the chat and I'm coming to you next. But um, my last question, I'm, I'm interested in, in both of your thoughts about, and we've touched on this just very briefly, just what impact the coronavirus is having on other campaigns further down the ballot, particularly in Kansas and Missouri, although we can certainly talk about other races in other states. Um, I'm interested in, in, you know, there's so many limitations on campaigning. Um, if you're a candidate who wasn't well known, it's hard to get out and do the glad handing. You can't do much in-person campaigning. Also, if you're a Republican, you're having to answer for Trump on coronavirus. Are there candidates or races in particular where you think um, a, a candidate has really benefited or suffered from what's happened during the pandemic? Dave, what do you think? Well, I'd go first, and I would say that the Missouri race with Mike Parson and Nicole Galloway is a place where we might see this show up in part because Missouri's response to the coronavirus has been less than uh, optimum, uh, particularly in recent weeks. And Mike Parson caught it, and his wife caught it. And so this whole dynamic of people saying, geez, if, you, if, it's, if it threatens the governor, it threatens me as well, I think we'll have some impact. And Mike Parson has basically followed the Trump playbook on his COVID response, which is leave it up to the counties, leave it up to the states, wear a mask if you want, let the big cities make their own decisions, and then the rural areas, as we've talked about on the editorial board, Colleen, as you know, I got an email the other day from someone who had traveled in rural southern Missouri, who in essence told me they don't even know it exists there. There's no mask, no distancing, no precautions whatsoever. People still gather for coffee. They still go to restaurants. They're still going to movies. They literally don't, don't and going to church, which is where, you know, churches combined with, and gatherings like that, combined with nursing homes in some of those smaller communities, you do get the occasional hotspot. So I think it could play a role there. Um, 
I, I, you know, I think it's going to be an interesting thing to see what happens in Kansas with the Senate race and even the third district house race where uh, it's pretty clear that Sharice Davids is talking a lot about COVID as well. Um, that may turn on different things because I think it may be less of a difference between Adkins and Davids than, than maybe it is in these other races. That's my own sense of it. Yeah, you know, it's been interesting to watch campaigns adapt to this. Um, and in many ways, Republican campaigns haven't had to adapt because they didn't really change strategies. Like Republicans never stopped knocking on doors. A lot of Democrats did, and I think we're starting to see Democratic campaigns nationally and in the Kansas legislature do more of that field, the door knocking, you know, no touch or no contact canvassing and so forth. Um, so Democrats are kind of changing to more traditional strategies late there. Um, I think there was, I had, I wondered how would voters learn and how would they engage um, when maybe candidates are not as aggressive or campaigns about reaching out in person. And, you know, it's been interesting to track individuals who, who look at numbers of online engagement and it appears that searches for candidates are up. Um, searches for COVID and what's happening with COVID policy are up. Traffic on websites for candidates is up. So I think to an extent you have an electorate that is a little anxious, looking for looking to learn, um, and seeking out some of that information themselves that maybe the campaigns aren't as aggressive about putting in front of their faces. Um, you know, people people wondered, you know, would Democrats because Democrats canceled a lot of these big fundraisers, Republicans didn't. Would Democrats be able to raise money? And you know, we're seeing Democrats raise a ton of money, particularly in small small donations, and in key federal races at least out outraise Republicans. So in that extent, you know, I think Democrats have adapted more because they changed their campaigns more. Um, in some ways, maybe still a little disadvantaged because of the door to door and other ways not with, with their cash. You know, one race I think where COVID does shape it, I mean, is the Kansas Senate race. Um, you're almost fated to because you have two medical professionals running against each other and then um, you know, Roger Marshall has very much embraced how Trump has acted on COVID, you know, even taking the experimental drug himself, or so he claimed. Um, he's really put himself in a position to create no distance between Donald Trump on COVID and himself. And if you look at the polling numbers in Kansas, Trump's job approval is higher than his, his performance on COVID specifically. So I think that you know, maybe at the margins helps Barbara Boyer some, um, for she was already talking about healthcare, but it might be one of those things that is one among many that is help keeping that race on our radar. Great, so we have our first audience question. Um, Kate K asks, over the summer, there were a lot of civil rights protests making national news. Do you think that this is still relevant and near the forefront of this election? Professor Miller, what do you think? Yeah, I think recently, especially, it has been drowned out by things happening with COVID um, and then the debates and then the, you know, the president's diagnosis. I think it did create a possible opening for Republicans. Um, you know, I personally think Republicans didn't message that correctly. I mean, you heard Donald Trump, I mean, look at his Twitter talking about low income housing in suburbia and these these marches and protests are a threat to suburbia and then Cory Booker is going to be out in suburbia as if he scares white suburban women. Um, I, I think they have messaged this as if it's the 1970s and the politics of suburbia is still a politics of white flight rather than 2020 where suburbia is more racially diverse. Um, suburbanites don't care as much about crime and racial issues in polling as rural populations actually do in polling. Um, and where attitudes about race in suburbs are often more conciliatory than they are in urban and rural areas. So I think I would have messaged that differently. Um, it possibly did have an opening, but I, I just think that was approached in the wrong way. I would just add this. I, I think that Dr. Miller hits on something very important, which is the suburbs are not only more diverse sort of ethnically than they used to be in many ways, but also uh, ideologically and politically. 
Um, I, I covered the, the race between Dennis Moore and Chris Kobach for the U.S. House seat, the 3rd District House seat, which, gosh, I want to say it was 2002, 2004, somewhere in there. And, of course, Chris's views on immigration at that point were fairly well known. He was obviously very conservative and, you know, I think it's fair to say anti-immigration to, to a large degree. And I remember talking to voters in Johnson County, the 3rd District, about Kobach, and, and th they would all give me the, a, a version of the idea that we don't want the country to see us as racist. We, we you know, we just don't, we're, we're much more, you know, tolerant than I think Chris Kobach gives us credit for. And I think that's still very much at work. And so when the president was, you know, clearing the streets and holding up the Bible and all that other stuff, I think suburban voters, particularly those who are more educated, thought, no, I don't really see this thread in the way he does. I do think that we're more tolerant than he gives us credit for. And I think that that was the key to me, uh, uh, to a large degree, behind the Sharice Davids victory of two years ago in the third district. Because by almost any other normal calculation, Kevin Yoder should have done fine. But, um, but I think the Trump impact was found among suburban voters, many of them women, who said, in essence, we want to show the world that we can tolerate a candidate like Sharice Davids, or that we like a candidate like Sharice Davids. Tolerate is probably a bad word, but, but, and I think that phenomenon is playing out all over the country, to 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 Donald Trump's de detriment, I must say. So another audience question, and Dave, I'll come to you first on this one. Um, Carson D asks, do you think the vice presidential debate will cover any other topics not covered in the last presidential debate? So if, if you're trying to decide whether to tune in, are we going to hear anything new tonight? Yeah, the question is, did we hear any real topics in the first presidential debate? I'm not sure they, I mean, I'm sure COVID will come up. I'm sure the COVID relief package will come up. I do hope that there's some discussion of foreign policy. Uh, you know, typically that's what they do ask vice presidents about, and I think that would be interesting to hear them talk about relations with China and, and tariffs and protectionism and the Middle East and, and relations with NATO. I mean, I do think that that's an important topic. Uh, you know, people are going to find that boring, but I do th hope they come up and talk about that a little bit. Um, but, but I think the economy, COVID, and law and order in that order will be the main topics tonight. You know, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it would be nice to cover some new ground. And I will definitely agree, you know, personally, I probably care an obscenely amount about foreign <laughs> policy, you know, more than the average voter. I'd love to hear more, but not betting we will. Um, I would just say, you know, you should watch it, um, even if it's the next day like me, uh, because mm -hmm. we have two presidential candidates who are older. Um, one of them has significant pre-existing conditions. Uh, I'm not sure if the other one does other than being older. Um, COVID's going around and there is a non-zero chance that one of these two individuals on this stage tonight may succeed to the presidency in the next four years. I mean, we don't wish that for either one, but you should know who these people are um, and be have some level of knowledge about what they're bringing um, to these campaigns and to government. So Angie asks, COVID has changed the me mechanics of campaigning more online, less in person. Does that favor some candidates over others? Um, Dave, I'm, I'm interested, obviously, so you look a lot at campaign ads and, and what candidates are doing. They're trying to campaign on Zoom. Is anyone doing that really well? Uh, not that I've seen. Uh, uh, I've seen a lot of ads. <laughs> and um, they haven't changed very much. You know, they, they, the pictures are more sinister and the voices are more, more uh, threatening. But, but the, that approach really hasn't changed. There is a great reliance still on postcards. And I tell people all the time, that's where the worst stuff is uh, in terms of claims and counterclaims, because there's no possible way that uh, those, those postcards can be given a sort of a truth watch scrutiny like you can to a TV ad. So beware of those. I, I do think, and maybe your audience would be interested in this, and Colleen, you can talk about this too. Um, um, COVID has changed political reporting just dramatically, right? I mean, it, first of all, 
the boys on the bus, there isn't really much of a bus anymore, particularly on the Joe Biden side. You were on the, the Hillary campaign plane. I mean, give us your own observations. Newsrooms are closed, basically. Um, our ability to talk with regular voters has been reduced because it's a threat. I mean, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. You're, you're absolutely right. And I mean, I, I spent what felt like years and years on the, on the campaign bus in, in both 2012 and, and 2016. And I mean, campaign reporters are A, with the candidate all the time. If, if Even if the candidate is, is giving you relatively little access, you at least have eyes on the candidate with, um, you know, all day, every day. And, and you also have a chance to kind of take the temperature of voters as you travel around the country. And um, I think right now it's really tough both um, for for reporters to get a sense of of the candidates momentum, the candidates mentality, and, and also just to kind of see little changes in the electorate. I mean, you would see you would have a chance to see how things were resonating on the campaign trail. And and at this point, we're all sitting in our houses and and, you know, tweeting at each other. And it's it's a lot tougher to to, to gauge how the candidates are doing and how voters think the candidates are doing. Yeah, and that, I would just add quickly, that's very important, not only at the presidential level, but at the states, you know, the U.S. Senate race, the House race. It, one of the dirty little secrets of political reporting is that most of it is done on the phone or in an office up until the, like, the last two or three weeks. And then the best reporters really do want to get out and talk to people and understand where what messages are clicking and just get a sense of it. And that's been really precluded uh, up till now. And so you don't, I mean, I don't really have a feel at all for Boye Marshall. I've, I've watched, you know, you're right. I've watched the ads. I watched the debate. Uh, we interviewed Bar Boye on a program that we do today um, that's at KansasCity.com just moments ago was posted. But, but, um, but to talk to voters, to get a sense of where messages are, are making a difference or not, I, I don't have a feel for that at all. And I think that really has changed political reporting here and across the country. Professor Miller, and to go back to the original question, do you think that um, uh, changing the way that candidates are campaigning is is that um, favoring any particular candidates? Um, it's, is this working for anyone? <laughs> well, in, a, in a typical campaign, the most effective forms of contact are in person face-to-face, -face, like knocking on the door, or having people work their social networks. Uh, if you want to persuade voters, you need to recruit people to persuade their friends and family. There's not much evidence that postcards are very effective. And I agree, I, I'm getting postcards in the Senate race right now in Kansas that are making claims about health care, and they cite bills in the US Senate that neither of these candidates had anything to do with. But then this bill is somehow proof that a certain candidate has a position on health care that's going to make it cheaper for you, right? I mean, ignore those postcards. Um, not a lot of evidence that those things are effective. Not a lot of evidence that calls are effective. Um, but what I think is different about this election is we are seeing some indicators that voters are more engaged than they normally are. So if you're not doing as much of that in-person campaigning, to an extent, I think voters compensate for that a little bit if they're looking up information more, trying to learn more. Who that benefits, I think it's very hard to say. I think you just have a universally kind of anxious electorate wanting to learn. Um, you know, if we have some races on election night where, I mean, given that it's Democrats who, who have kind of unilaterally disarmed more on door to door, uh, not Republicans. You know, if we have some close races on election night in swing districts and you have Republicans beating Democrats by a couple of points, you could probably say that might have been because the Democrat didn't knock doors. Sure. Right. I mean, I think that might be our our, our best sense after the fact of where that might have mattered uh, um, a little bit. Yeah, the other part of that, too, by the way, is state house and state Senate races. And Dr. Miller, you know a lot about these races. It's not just door knocking, but they do uh, forums, you know, little neighborhood things where 10 candidates will show up. And and I'm always, you know, I've moderated several of those and I'm always shocked that 100 people will show up and, and listen to candidates. And then the important thing is those 100 people talk to 100 of their neighbors. And so they can, they can sometimes make a difference. And we're not going to have any of those this year. And I, I think that will have an impact too. One thing Democrats are doing 
that I've not heard about Republicans doing in federal or state campaigns is using some, some new online platforms to try to virtually create some of those, some of those forums. So, you know, the idea being that you can recruit your supporters to recruit their friends um, and you kind of put your supporters in a position where they're making the contacts rather than you as the campaign and then getting people to come on to a Zoom happy hour or something like that. A lot of democratic campaigns have been really advertising their efforts to do that. I've not seen any Republican campaigns doing that. Um, I don't know if that's gonna be effective per se or even that what the Republicans are doing is gonna be effective, but it is a difference I think in how they're approaching that. Zoom happy hours pretty much sum up 2020. <laughs> so, um, with that, uh, time is expiring on us, unfortunately, but this has been a really compelling conversation. Um, I want to thank Dave Helling of the Kansas City Star and KU professor Patrick Miller for sharing their unique insights on what really has been a campaign unlike any other. Uh, we'll be back next Wednesday at 4 p.m. to talk more about the three issues that have been game changers in this race. Next week, we'll be talking more about the pandemic, but also about the economy and, um, and social unrest. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Please come back next week. And if your Wednesday afternoons are already booked, you'll be able to find all of these discussions archived on the Dole Institute's YouTube channel. I hope to see you soon for more politics, pandemic, and protests from the Dole Institute at KU. Thanks.